Peace and love, everyone. Welcome. My name is Andrew Hewson. I'm a spiritual teacher. I'm here with my friend, David Davidja Buckland. David is someone that I highly admire uh, and revere. He is uh, an author. He has a blog, uh, davidja.ca, where he writes about the subject of spiritual realization, uh, how that relates to psychology and science and how that shows up in daily life. We've been having talks for about a year now, and this talk is the third talk of a series where we're specifically going over the stages of realization, the stages of un unfoldment. And David and I both uh, love this subject. We speak about it quite often, and we like to explore the details of how it shows up uh, in different physiologies, the various possibilities, so on and so forth. So we have different ways of speaking about it and uh, come from a different context. And so as we come together, we witness uh, a complementary overview of uh, this graced process of enlightenment. So here we're going to be talking about nothing, which is going to be an interesting <laughs> discussion. <laughs> So I really appreciate you uh, taking the time again to be here with me today, David. Oh, you're more than welcome. I'm very happy that we're doing these. There's a lot of details that aren't widely understood, and so it's really good to, to bring them out. Um, I think probably first, because we could set the stage a little bit. Um, so on our prior talk, our prior talks, we talked first about self-realization um, and God consciousness, about the initial awakening. Uh, and the unfoldment of refined perception on the awakening heart. In the last conversation, we talked about the unity shift and its refined version. Um, and now we're going to talk about the beyond stage. Um, and it's always interesting to talk about because it's, it's beyond the field of experience. So it's mm -hmm. beyond any qualities or normal reference points that anybody might have. And yet it's very possible for it to be lived. Mm -hmm. So essentially, in later stages of unity, the unity stage, our oneness, uh, we come to a point where the self has come to know itself fully in some way. Now there's, there's various uh, contexts we have or we bring to this, various perspectives we have or how it's unfolding specifically, but the underlying process is consciousness comes to know itself fully in some way. And so there's, uh, consciousness aware of itself in this kind of a space. And it's always been looking in on itself. Um, this wasn't obvious at first. And, you know, someone in unity will tend to see consciousness as infinite and eternal. And, it, you know, so the idea there's something beyond it is a bit, uh, seems a bit uh, false. But at a certain point, uh, that looking in on itself knows itself fully and then it kind of turns and looks beyond itself. Now, it's hard to say how that's going to unfold exactly. Um, another another option is there's a full uh, refined unity stage unfolding and a God realization where there's unification with our, our uh, personal form of God uh, we discussed prior. Then, um, then that's kind of like, like a, can be a climactic uh, mm. uh, unification. Um, and this, and or, or consciousness, consciousness looking on itself, or however it unfolds, there's a there's a turning and looking beyond. Mm. Uh, in the Vedic tradition, they refer to this as Brahman, which means the great, and it's referred to as the great awakening, uh, because we're essentially surrendering our prior enlightenment. It's a pretty massive shift, because before this, there's a profound intimacy with everything, because we are it. And, and that's grown over a period of time, become greater and greater and greater. And it reaches a point where, where we transcend that. And so it's and like somewhat like in first awakening, where we transcend the personal ego to become the cosmic self. In this stage, we're, we're transcending the cosmic self to become Brahman, or in, it's often referred to as that, with a capital T in the, in the uh, in the Vedic text. Um, and 
it's describing it as an interesting paradox because on the one hand you have this collapse of all dualities even these subtle dualities that were still present in unity of conscious not conscious existence not existence these all collapse in in uh, in brahman and it so it's this profound resolution of paradox and yet to talk about it is completely paradoxical <laughs> And, and it gets confused a lot though. And we're using the, I'm using the term Brahman in, in a very specific way. Um, there are, uh, there are uh, places, uh, there's a Mahavakya, for example, that Atman equals Brahman, Atman is mm -hmm. Brahman. But that doesn't mean they're the same thing. It means that Atman has recognized that Atman is Brahman also. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, so yeah. just, um, yeah. in that Atman, and Brahman recognition. I'll just uh, sort of go back to our, our last discussion on unity. I mentioned a stage which I refer to as source awareness, which is sort of uh, what you call the taste of Brahman prior to the full unfoldment of the unification of the masculine and feminine aspects of the self or the Atman. And in that condition, the difference between what I refer to as source awareness and then the void, which is comparable to what you're referring to as Brahman, is that the self still remains fully, uh, fully present. And not that it ever really disappears, but in that source awareness, there appears to be this sort of equilibrium where we recognize this field of full light that is the self, that is the Atman, and then also that unmanifest source or totality, which it is shining from. Now, I think that that condition is sort of where I uh, recognize that statement, the Atman is Brahman, because they're sort of held in an equilibrium. And then at a later stage, uh, at least in the way that it unfolded here in, a, in several other cases that I've seen, then that... Uh, that field of full light seems to disappear or become insubstantial and the no thingness or the nothingness sort of comes into the foreground. Yes, and it's important here to distinguish terms a little bit too, to be very clear. Uh, you use the word void, for example, mm -hmm. uh, which is a very good word on the one hand, but it can not, this is not to be confused with emptiness. Yes. Because emptiness is a quality of space. And that mm. quality of consciousness being self-aware creates a subtle space. And, and that can be experienced as either an emptiness or fullness in prior stages. But in this stage now, we're talking about uh, a no-thingness, uh, a, a void of things, a void of qualities. Yes. Beautiful. Yeah, that's a great point. The, the word void refers to the total condition where, um, of course, we're, we're working within the limits of language. So... Uh, no, no word is really sufficient to describe it, but uh, it, it's a non-spatial void. It's, a, it's an infinite void, which is what you are, what, the, what reality has recognized itself to be. So it's a total condition, which seems to be a way that it actually, we recognize later uh, after that condition is shifted out of, uh, wasn't the way that it seemed to be, but subjectively, it it shows up as uh, an infinite supreme voidness or nothingness, no thingness. Yes, and so for some people, the initial Brahman shift can be quite high contrast. Mm -hmm. Go from being everything to being nothing. Yes, and sometimes what happens in in the, initially, as as happened here, is that what we're conscious of is what's fallen away. Mm. Not so much about what's here, because Brahman is quite a bit more subtle than consciousness. Yes. Um, and so there can be a, a, an initial stage where there is a you know, more more uh, conscious of absence than something. But then, yes. um, just as consciousness is what knows consciousness, it's mm. Brahman that knows Brahman. Mm. We don't learn. We don't discover Brahman through consciousness. We discover it through itself. Yes. And, and so there is this progressive progression into um, its self-discovery. I've also seen cases where people kind of came to the doorway, they sort of began, became conscious of, of something, 
more of, of the Brahmin, but they were kind of like, oh, <laughs> <laughs> it's like stepping off a cliff again, you know, it's like, oh, and, and they step back and then yes. they kind of step to the doorway and then step back. And then when they finally made the shift, they kind of brought a little, little bit more with them. And so there was less of that, um, less of the sense of um, loss and uh, more of a sense of what, what's here now. Just yeah, that's a, a familiarization first. Yeah, that's a beautiful point, David. And it just reminds me about um, this sort of difference between nothingness with a lowercase n and, and nothingness or nothingness with a, with a capital N. I was speaking about um, speaking with someone yesterday who's in the first uh, stage of nothingness, we might say, with a lowercase n, where the superficial uh, conceptual value of uh, everything that has been projected onto the experiencing has sort of been removed. And so they're in the initial stages and they're still speaking in terms of nothingness, but it's referential to the labels. It's referential to what seemed to be going on before. So people aren't doing anything. The bodies aren't doing anything. They're doing nothing, right? They just think yeah. they're doing something. And that stage is much different from the stage we're talking about here because we're talking about it in terms of actual field value, nothingness or no thingness, which is a big difference. Uh, there it's referential, which includes of course, uh, form because at that point, there isn't any sort of distinction between the field and the form anymore, or there's a distinction, but there's no duality. Um, after we've uh, unfolded both aspects of conscious awareness, but in this sort of initial shift, uh, there can be a sense of nothingness, but it's not the nothingness that we're referring to here. This is something that is an all-encompassing totality uh, of nothingness, which is really supreme. It has a supreme quality to it, um, it at least uh, until we sort of go beyond that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> yes, there's a and so as that, that um, integrates, there is a um, there's a profound sense of, of totality to it, mm. uh, is how it's often worded. It's not the same wholeness that you had in uh, the unity stage. Mm. It becomes a, a totality, uh, hence the supreme or, or the great. Mm. Um, and then we start to find there's these fine qualities that are there, but they're not qualities that are, you now getting a little ahead of ourselves here, I guess, but they're not expressed qualities, but they're like seeds of what become qualities. Mm -hmm. There's, um, and as, as it integrates, there's kind of this, this interesting experience of, we know the world's not there, it, not that it's an illusion, but it was never created in the first place. And yet there it is to the senses, it's experienced the senses. And it's not like, you know, the world is gone. It's that the world never was created in the first place. Mm. So the, the sense of the world being an appearance uh, becomes very distinct uh, mm -hmm. as opposed to an illusion or, or as a divine play. And it's, it's, so there's then this progressive integration. And in the prior stages, you were in self-realization and then you were in you know, unity or you went through a God consciousness phase and then unity or, or there were, you were in each distinct phase. And when you were in unity, it was hard to remember what the previous stage was like. Mm -hmm. But in Brahman, it has this totality to it and it becomes inclusive of everything. Yes. So nothing has been created and yet here it is. Um, the Brahman shift has happened and yet there's the availability to, re to reference unity and to reference self-realization. Yeah. Um, it, it becomes more inclusive of, of all of it. Yeah, that's a really great point, David. It's, it's um, the way I've, I see it and the way it showed up here is almost like um, that stage is sort of there outside of time and you can go back to it um, w when it is needed or you can drop into it um, according to the proximate environment that kind of calls it forth. Um, in, in its usefulness or sort of uh, expression as service even, at least in the context of teaching or um, sort of being with someone that is in that stage. 
it doesn't negate or take away from the the totality shift or the sort of beyond conscious awareness shift um, but it just allows for a greater flexibility to sort of tune into those uh, infinite uh, channels uh, TV channels as I like to call it <laughs> yes <laughs> <laughs> yeah there's a quote uh, from Shankara the sage Shankara um, he said the world is unreal mm. only Brahman is real the world is Brahman mm. So you have this paradoxical kind of quote again, but the world is, appears to us because it is Brahman, not because it has reality in itself. So the world is unreal in itself, but as Brahman, it's real because it's yeah. Brahman, because that's all that's real. <laughs> yeah. And, and the Manduka Upanishad said, the knower of Brahman is Brahman itself. Again, what I said earlier, it's Brahman that knows itself. We don't know Brahman through consciousness, the self-interacting dynamics of consciousness. We know Brahman through Brahman, through mm -hmm. being it. And it's not that we have consciousness recognize there's something beyond itself in that shift, but when that step takes place, it's not consciousness that knows Brahman, it's Brahman itself that knows Brahman. And so mm -hmm. until you are Brahman or recognize you already have been, um, then Brahman can't know itself. Now, sometimes people use Brahman to refer to uh, samadhi or transcendence in meditation and and, uh, and the silence and, and so on like that. And, you know, and in this, the, from the perspective of Brahman, that's true. But prior to that, it's not really uh, Brahman itself. Yes. And um, it's important also to note that there are certain teachers that use uh, Brahman to refer to um, consciousness or conscious awareness which is different from the way that um you're using it yes. and um one famous teacher nizargadatta maharaj a non-dual uh, advaita vedanta teacher he referred to para brahman as what you're referring to as brahman um so he referred to beyond conscious awareness as para brahman but actually uh in the way you're using it Parabrahman is something totally, totally different. So yeah, it's beyond to clarify for the for the viewers, maybe uh, uh, privy to that to that languaging. Yeah, because Parabrahman is means beyond Brahman. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The, the term itself. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. Another another uh, distinction is in unity. It's a becoming process. Whatever mm -hmm. we experience, we recognize we are. And become it's this gradual progression of, of unification brahman is kind of reverse it it's said mm -hmm. to devour whatever yes. arises is is recognized to be brahman and and, and thus is recognized to be uh, nothing <laughs> yeah that's that's a beautiful yeah. extremely beautiful point and it kind of goes back to um that refinement of the brahman knowing itself that you're referring to earlier which i would sort of contextualize a little bit differently um, from the term void or, or vacancy, supreme nothingness, but it's the, essentially the same process. One thing that shifts is uh, from the space of being infinite conscious awareness, the value of unmanifest and manifest is really referential to the unmanifest value of the self and its manifest value as the various layers of expressed appearance but what i found shifted um when there's a going beyond conscious awareness is that the the recognition of unmanifest and manifest shifts as well mm -hmm. so now the light that before was seen to be unmanifest is actually recognized to be the manifest so it moves from a field form unmanifest manifest to a field field unmanifest manifest now there's the unmanifest field shining as the manifest field of light within which the whole play of the world is appearing and in that uh in the unity refined unity or what i refer to as dynamic subjectivity stage there's this uh thisness thisness you spoke about the word that but in that full field vibrancy and that uh that flowing fullness that that is recognized itself there's this immediacy of the sense of thisness and that shows up in the contrast between that and this that <laughs> is shining as this 
<laughs> so we have this infinite thisness in uh, within an infinite thatness. Mm -hmm. And a part of that sort of devouring process, uh, I would say, is where the thisness sort of falls away in a certain sense, so that it the thatness becomes more prominent. And and in that also the 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 sort of fullness of the forms, the appearances of the thisness also uh, begin to have more of a thatness as their uh, recognition of what they are. So it's a, that sense of devouring or revealing the total field and its content and its form really to be made out of nothingness or no thingness. Yes, this also points to, to why Brahman is, is kind of the true non-duality that mm. uh, Shankar was, was speaking of. Sometimes people use the term in reference to self-realization because there's a kind of inner non-duality, but there's a separate, perhaps illusory world. Uh, mm. But uh, unity is where you start to develop much more of that oneness and, because everything becomes inclusive of it. And then you go beyond that, collapsing even those subtle dualities of, of, uh, of unity. There's another um, interesting detail too, uh, known as Lesha Vidya, the remains of ignorance. Essentially, there is a, a, this a bit of uh, humanness <laughs> uh, required to to uh, for for unity to function, and this becomes actually even more so in uh, Brahman, because Brahman is a human living uh, a Brahman consciousness, or the Brahman stage is a human living Brahman. Mm. Without that human living Brahman, you don't really have that Brahman stage. It needs needs a a, a bit of a person to to be able to express it. Hmm. And of course, it, you know, talking about this and that and, and, and those kind of things, it's kind of the mind kind of goes uh, off the rails a little there is really <laughs> something you, you can figure out with the mind, even someone in unity stage, this isn't going to make any sense to, uh, yes. because for them, it's all the self and there is nothing else. Hmm. And here we're talking about something entirely different uh, and yet the same. So yeah, it's a it's a it's a very curious uh, topic to talk about, and yet it's very much something that we can live. Yeah, it is something we can live in, and I think it is. Uh, or I I know it's relevant to talk about because when I was when these stages were unfolding here, you know what I found was that there was a drawing to the stage what whatever material or teaching or sort of um, expression was coming from the stage that was unfolding. So it sort of had a deeper resonance, um, with the laws of nature in, in that sort of impulse to continue, uh, or to unfold in, in a certain direction or directionless direction, if you will. And so having that, uh, the, the capacity to sort of hear what is beyond the mind, sort of filter through the mind, express itself, in in a way which is you know somewhat communicable uh, is helpful uh, because it gives it, it supports the 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 unification and the integration of what's happening on its own and of course could never be brought about through listening to David and Andrew talk about something but yes. at the same time what's going on behind David and Andrew appearing to speak you know and as we speak about that supreme no thingness as we speak about that supreme thatness is it possible that there is a subtler than the subtlest recognition that could shine forth yes that that is appearing as this speaking as this experiencing <laughs> yes yes and it's and it's key too, because there's a lot of people now on spiritual paths mm -hmm. um, without a formal teacher or an in-person teacher. Uh, traditionally, this kind of knowledge was given out uh, when the student was ready, when they came to that point. There was yeah. probably some general overview and, and so on. Vedanta, um, you know, the Upanishads, the Bhagavad Gita, the Brahma Sutra, mm. uh, those are all texts uh, that talk about this stuff. Um, 
but a lot of it, you know, the, the verification and support of this was, was always done in person. But nowadays, you know, we're spread out over the world and people are, are there's a, a rising consciousness that is causing people to, to awaken. And if you live that, that shift naturally, a number of those people are going to move forward into higher stages, which mm -hmm. points to why we're talking about this kind of thing to help, you know, primarily to help support um, people who are reaching this, these kind of places. And uh, I mean, secondarily, just to, to have a broader um, understanding of the path for people. So they know when they're, when they're reading the Brahma Sutra, what they're talking about, because, uh, you know, if you try and apply self-realization to that or whatever, it, it, you know, the pieces, the puzzle pieces don't all fit together properly. Beautiful. Yeah, going back to that, uh, when you mentioned sort of how conscious awareness sort of looks beyond itself, uh, in, in sort of the initial unfoldment of the shift, what what comes to show up in that refined value is that actually it was that we or what we are was looking from the thatness into the the appearance of the the field of conscious awareness. So it sort of shifts that perspective, so that we were looking from that unmanifest field into the manifest field of light uh, that is none other than that we come to realize. Yes. Another, another important detail about the uh, process is this kind of masculine and feminine duality. Mm -hmm. um, the, uh, it, that shows up in a number of ways as the, you know, the observing consciousness and the field of experience and form um, and so forth. And in the stages model, we, we talk about, um, there's kind of the, the shifts in consciousness itself and mm -hmm. there's the shifts in the uh, refinement and the awakening heart and so on, the more feminine side, mm -hmm. uh, that they, they're kind of uh, parallel but intertwined uh, processes, but they're somewhat distinct in terms of how they're unfolding for individuals. Like some people will go through the self-realization and unity process with very little mm -hmm. uh, refinement going on, and other people will have a lot of refinement and uh, kind of that stronger feminine side uh, oriented. So, so there, what unfolds potentially then is a refined stage of Brahman. Now it's mm -hmm. kind of a bit obscure to say refined Brahman when, <laughs> when there's no thing, <laughs> what is it that's refining? But there's a, but the understanding of Brahman of itself uh, definitely um, refines. And there's a much greater uh, totality of recognition, you could say. And, uh, and I mentioned earlier those those subtle qualities like like alertness and liveliness and intelligence that are there in Brahman, but not expressed. So we could say there's an alertness like Brahman can know itself through that quality of alertness, but the alertness hasn't expressed in the consciousness, um, and and so on. And those actually turn out not to be to originate in Brahman. <laughs> they they they're actually have a more subtle. Uh, origin that we'll get into uh, in our next conversation in Parabrahman. But, um, you know, so at that point, I basically I become a person I came to see Brahman as the afterglow of divinity uh, beyond that. But essentially, once we know Brahman, we've gone as far in the consciousness process as we can on the masculine side. So then it's all, all on the feminine side, really, uh, all about refinement and progression. Um, yeah. yeah, that's really beautiful, uh, David. I just um, I just actually looked up uh, an email that uh, I had sent to you probably a, a year or so ago. When we first were making contact, I was describing the um, this this shift, and so I was just going to read the description real quick uh, because I, f I felt like, in terms of you describing a refined Brahman, it might be. You know, of course, it's only a description, but it is what it is. So in this description, uh, the field or screen of manifest conscious awareness, which is all there is at this point, objectivity as a perceptual modification has disappeared, qualitatively shifts into sort of a perpetual vacuum. The existenceness or beingness of the field itself is like sucked out. The field and phenomenal emergence is experienced as a nothingness, a silent infinitude. It's profoundly peaceful and impressive. 
far beyond the initial realization of pure awareness as the self. When it came on here, walking down the beach was like a pure, silent transparency. The phenomenal emergence was like a continuum of infinite silence where the seagulls, ocean, clouds, sand, buildings were transparently empty of existence. Even the initial bliss of the field pales in comparison because of the infinitely silent peace which prevails as an absolute vacancy. This state was recognized immediately and even expected hmm. yeah. as it had been uh, presented prior to its emergence. Yeah, so it's a fascinating um, shift in, in the style of experience. Mm. You'd be walking in the world and, and seeing, you know, perceiving, uh, <laughs> uh, and yet knowing intimately that it's just an appearance. Yeah. And yet it's an appearance, it's not of yourself, it's the wrong way of putting it, but, uh, but of your essential nature. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. yeah, even that. Yeah, even that, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but of what is real, of reality. It's like, it's reality. reality, but it's not, it's it's an appearance of reality. It's not, it, well, it is reality, but mm -hmm. but it's not at the same time. Yeah, not in its appearance. Yeah. Yeah, yeah there's another thing about Brahman uh, that c can come up. Um, one of my teachers said that uh, everyone can realize, but not everyone cognize. Mm. Now, cognize is a is a word I'm using for a certain style of experience, where it's kind of like a download, um, where we, where the entirety of an experience of an object is known. Uh, for example, um, say this pen, um, you know, you experience it. You see one side, and and you have some memories of of you know how it works and how to use it or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, but if you cognize the pen, you it's like you experience it from all sides simultaneously, mm -hmm. and its entire history and its nature, what it's made of, where where all those uh, components came from, and it's just this totality of knowledge. Mm. And what tends to happen if there's a cognition is that there's kind of like this big download, and then there's a a period of time to process it so that um, the mind can digest it a bit, and then words can be given, and so on like that. And um, what I found is that there's there's uh, stages of cognition, or mm. styles of cognition, you could say. Um, the grand the grand type is what I refer to as a Vedic cognition. Uh, it's essentially there's these core memories in the divine mind um, that are kind of like the blueprint of the structure of creation, and at certain points in the schedule of creation, to put it that way, in the apparent unfolding process, a sage arises who cognizes uh, that detail in the structure, and that awakens a law of nature, which then integrates with existing laws of nature and furthers the evolution of creation. Um, so the the some of the old Vedic texts are essentially a composite, uh, a compiling of, of Vedic cognitions of, of ancient seers mm. uh, of old when consciousness was higher. Uh, there's another style uh, of cognition I call recognition, um, where essentially the, uh, in the, cycle, the vast cycles of time, consciousness rises and falls in the collective. And during a rising cycle, uh, there'll be people who come along and revive beta cognitions, bring, make them enliven, enliven them again, and uh, awaken those those uh, slumbering laws of nature. Um, in low ages, uh, quite a few of the laws of nature uh, essentially fall asleep for long periods of time. Mm. And then, as consciousness rises, they're grad they gradually reawake reawakened by being recognized by um, by people capable of that. Uh, then there's what I refer to as expressors. Um, there are people who experience those fine values, uh, not as a cognition, but 
revive, essentially reviving and spreading through experience. So someone can recognize uh, a quality of nature and then expressors will, will um, experience those qualities that have woken, woken up and kind of make it more enlivened uh, more broadly in, in collective consciousness. Mm. And then finally, you have your basic cognition where, where uh, those lively memories uh, in, the, in the collective are directly cognized um, in, a, in kind of a basic form. And I've seen examples of people who can have those kind of basic cognitions uh, even prior to awakening. Mm. Um, but they have to have fairly developed uh, refinement in order to, to have those, the style of experience. You know, because essentially um, the world, as you mentioned earlier, is structured in layers. Mm. At its most uh, fundamental, we have Brahman that we're talking about. And then within Brahman, cognitive, uh, consciousness becomes self-aware and then uh, expresses from consciousness. Um, that's beyond the, the, the context of our discussion here. But, and then it, then it kind of builds up in layers. Um, uh, and until we experience uh, form on the surface and have experiences, but it all takes place within consciousness. Yeah, that's really uh, it's a really beautiful point. I sort of jokingly had a less sophisticated way of describing cognitions. One was um, a sitting cognition <laughs> that comes during meditation, and the other was a walking walking cognition where you're walking along and all of a sudden a comprehensive knowledge of a certain aspect of creation comes out of nowhere. Yeah. And uh, one thing that's interesting is you've spoken about the sheaths and uh, how even conscious awareness itself can be recognized as a sheath when you go beyond it. Right. Sort of a covering or a veil in a certain context. I mean, of course, it's not, there's no negative connotations or anything. Um, but I also see that nothingness itself also can be recognized as a certain sort of she, there a certain sort of veil, um, which is trend, not maybe not in the same sense of sort of uh, whole containing like, like it is in conscious awareness, but something that must be sort of transcended or seen beyond in order to realize the reality of pure divinity, which we're not going to go all the way into, but just talking about how even that supreme status of nothingness uh, is something that hmm, has the potential to be transcended. Yeah. 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 So I, yeah, in a sense, Brahman is the, I mentioned earlier about being the afterglow. I'd mm -hmm. agree with the word veil. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't call it a sheath though, in that sense. Okay. It's yeah. not a, like a, a layer around us kind of a thing. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, a number of there's a kind of a five kosher model that's used, uh, sheath, kosher sheath model that's used by a lot of uh, Vedic oriented teachers. Um, because from the perspective of consciousness uh, and self realization or unity, uh, consciousness is infinite and eternal, so it's not a sheath. Uh, and so they kind of count five within that. But when you, rec you know, transcend into Brahman, then you recognize that, that consciousness is also a sheath, and you end up with what I use is the seven kosher model where there's consciousness and then there's the, uh, we might call creation within consciousness and then so on mm -hmm. from there. Um, yeah, it's an interesting, parabrahman is a really interesting one because you kind of, there's, there's little hints. It's kind of like um, <laughs> in self-realization, you kind of, you recognize that I'm not the doer. Mm -hmm. So the question can come up. So what's doing the doing? Uh, what's motivating me to, to take these actions or, or do these things? It's just happening. And in the same kind of way, you know, as you refine in, in Brahman and you recognize there's these qualities um, like alertness and, and intelligence and so on, they don't have an obvious source in that, in that sense. And so the, there can be the question. And so as that process refines, we come to a place known as uh, well, place is the wrong word, but <laughs> um, we come to a, a, a stage of, of para Brahman, and para again means, means beyond. Hmm. And this is known in the sense that, that consciousness is the source, 
power brahman becomes recognized as the source of the source those subtle qualities and uh well everything that comes after that uh all are recognized come out of power brahman uh, also known as as uh, pure divinity mm -hmm. um like the context uh, in consciousness we can experience pure consciousness in samadhi or mm -hmm. transcendence when we go beyond the mind and just experience consciousness by itself or we can experience consciousness as the world and, and everything in it um so there's but you know by going beyond that we can experience consciousness by itself uh, and in the same way, we can experience uh, forms of divinity within the field of creation, within consciousness. Uh, we can experience uh, more abstract values of that. Mm -hmm. But until we come to Parabrahman, we don't know pure divinity, divinity by itself, without Brahman, without consciousness. Yeah, that's a that's a great point. We're gonna and it we're gonna talk. Um... We're going to really go into some detail about that in, in our in our next discussion and how it really ties up some loose ends, you might say, when when we arrive at that, um, makes the whole process much clearer than it was. And what I found was that there were still some subtle paradoxes, even in the even in the totality of nothingness, even in that supreme uh, recognition of of silent um, non-spatial vacancy. And it's kind of like you know the light of the the sun uh, shining and and looking back on itself as the light through it you know the light sort of turning around and looking back towards the sun, but the sun not being there there just being no thingness almost like a black dark field, <laughs> so <laughs> something isn't lining up um, because it's like this light. <laughs> was appearing to shine from a no lightness you know what i mean the infinite yeah. no lightness and uh but but because of the how would you say because it is a supreme appearance because it is a, and not appearance in the typical sense of the term but the this sort of um how would you say it um qualityless canvas uh upon which the the, the the supreme artist of, of pure divinity paints the whim of uh, creation and it at first in that quality less no thingness it's recognized that it's beyond it's beyond the masculine feminine distinction but that is actually kind of a step down version of the masculine feminine distinction or we can look at it like that we could we come to find out that we can see it as that and that there's a supreme version of the masculine feminine distinction sometimes uh you know spoken of as the divine couple like radha krishna that kind of thing um shiva and shakti. But, go ahead as i said shiva and shakti shiva and shakti yes but in this context i would say shiva and shakti refers to the to the step down version or the mm -hmm. um the atma the atmic version yeah and then, of course, there's that the source value of the masculine uh, feminine as well. So that uh, what what seen what at first was recognized to be beyond the masculine and the feminine actually later on in in pure divinity, uh, which is not later in time or anything like that necessarily, but sort of beyond time later on later we, in, discovery. <laughs> in our discovery there you go thank you <laughs> we we recognize it to be the supreme it has the potential to be recognized as the supreme value of the masculine uh in a new way so that's really beautiful and I, i've that's kind of been in the, the the foreground uh over the past year or so so in terms of that uh yeah, sort of the the coupling of that and how um, that relates to the to the unfoldment of the of the presentation of creation. Um, yeah, it's also important to we'll go into this uh, later, but uh, it's important to understand that uh, Parabrahman is, is like uh, unity in that sense. It's mm -hmm. like these three three. It's like self-realization, God consciousness, unity. And a Brahman, para Brahman, uh, a Brahman, refined Brahman, para Brahman, kind of, mm -hmm. and there's certain similarities between them, and in their pro in the process, 
so parabrahman like unity has a progressive series of stages of unfold mm -hmm. yeah. um, of the depth of our knowing the pure divinity yeah which is pure divinity actually knowing itself tasting itself through this unique flower of the human physiology very good point yes yeah so it's really beautiful it's amazing and <laughs> yeah starts to uh really kind of swell up even just to start to talk about it so yes <laughs> 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 well i think we've really covered uh a lot of the major points surrounding the the, the brahman shift or what i refer to as the the void contextual modality supreme nothingness uh, is there anything else that you can think of that we we've missed maybe it's good yeah good all right well as always it's been uh an absolute pleasure to to speak with you and uh to witness the flow unfold. Um, I, I'm really grateful uh, for the opportunity to, to have these types of conversations, not a common, a common affair. <laughs> so, so much grace. And we just give all glory to pure divinity. All glory. <laughs>